Roddy, come on out from under there. No! Come on. I saw a monster in the closet. There is no such thing as monsters. But I saw it. such thing as monsters. Welcome to our video on our locking wall gun racks from LockingGunRacks.com. They include two different sizes for most all types of rifles and shotguns, having standard size stocks. The three gun vertical locking gun rack and the nine gun locking wall gun rack. We also offer a locking pistol rack that will hold up to three revolvers and semi-automatic handguns of various sizes. Since all of our gun racks have similar construction, this video will show the manufacturing process of the nine gun rifle and shotgun rack and a mounting demonstration of all gun racks. All parts are precision cut from metal having a thickness of 1 8 to 5 8 inches. The gun rack's base frame is placed in a mold where all parts are welded in their exact place to achieve each gun's highest security when locked inside the rack. The gun rack is then removed from the mold, cleaned, and then dipped coated in plastisol that provides a glossy, durable coating to protect each gun's finish. Both rifle shotgun racks can be mounted several ways. The 9-gun rifle and shotgun rack, with barrel rest attached, mounts approximately 12 inches above the floor to two wall framing studs on 14 to 24 inch centers using two 3 8 by 2 1⁄2 inch hex head screws, or they can also be mounted to a solid wall. The 3-gun rack mounts to a single wall framing stud or to a solid wall. Both racks can also be mounted above a countertop or a strong shelf for gun store display and law enforcement use. And if several gun racks are needed, they can be mounted side by side approximately two inches apart. Both rifle racks can also be mounted inside gun cabinets to secure all firearms while on display. And for additional protection from unauthorized removal of all of our gun racks, small round screw head guards are tapped over each hex head screw. All firearms having standard size gun stocks are placed in their narrow individual stalls. Both racks will lock up your rifles with or without scopes and or shotguns in or out of gun socks or gun sleeves to protect them from collecting dust. The curved end of the metal locking bar is then placed through one of the openings located on the side of the base frame, passing along the front of each gun's narrowest section of the hand grip area and through the opening located at the other end of the frame. A padlock is then placed through the hole located at the end of the locking bar. Because each individual stall is smaller than the butt end of each gun stock, the guns cannot be removed from pulling upward or downward once they are locked inside the gun rack. To remove the guns, simply unlock the padlock and slide the locking bar out about one and a half inches, then swing the bar outward to retrieve the guns. The same procedure applies to the three gun rack for placing and retrieving of firearms. The pistol rack is mounted to a single wall stud using the same procedure as the rifle and shotgun racks with screw head guards in place. Each revolver or semi-automatic handgun is placed in the rack with a steel peg passing through the trigger guard.
They are then secured by a wide metal locking bar that passes through each hole located at the end of the rack's base frame. A padlock is then placed through the hole located in the top end of the locking bar. To remove the pistols, simply unlock the padlock. The locking bar will drop downward and stop at the bottom end of the rack, allowing quick access to all handguns. definitely seen an increase in gun sales across our area the past few months. Yeah, Ariana, and because of that, police say gun thefts could become a bigger problem. Adam Rasmussen joins us live in the newsroom with more on this story. Good evening, Adam. Hey, Chris. Police told me more than 80% of burglaries happen in the daytime when homeowners aren't around, but there are options out there to keep your guns protected. The safe place holds true to its name. Good luck breaking into one of these bad boys, which are in high demand. We are overwhelmed with business right now. At the safe place, you can find just about anything you need to protect your guns. If you plan on buying one of these certified safes, expect to spend anywhere from $900 to $9,000. And make sure you bolt it down, um, if at all possible, whether it's a subfloor or concrete. Anything's better than nothing. We asked Pete why he's seen such a surge in business recently. The restrictions that are being put on the firearms and everybody is trying to get their hands on what they can. And police say criminals are also getting their hands on what they can. The problem is most people don't like putting their guns in safes because they can't get to them. The bad guys know that and uh, they know where the common hiding places are, you know, in the nightstand, under your mattress, in, in your closet. Those are easy targets for criminals and homeowners make it a little easy on them. Police told us half of gun owners don't have a secure hiding spot. It's somewhere where, where you wouldn't think you'd find a gun. Uh, if you need to put it in a safe when you go to work, uh, make sure it's a large safe, something that can't be picked up and taken away. Well, along with hiding your guns, police gave us a few other tips for protecting your homes as well. They say a good way is with better locks. Also, an alarm system is a great way to keep intruders out. Police also suggest neighbors band together to keep an eye on each other's homes. And if you don't want to spend the money on an alarm system, police say a big dog will do the trick as well. Covering the big story live, Adam Rasmussen, Channel 2 News. Good tips. Okay. Thanks, Adam. <laughs>
Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Just before sunrise on April 12, 1861, the first shot was fired in the American Civil War. A heavy mortar roared, sending a shell high over the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. The shell dropped and exploded above Fort Sumter, a United States military base on an island in the harbor. The explosion was a signal for all Confederate guns surrounding the fort to open fire. Shell after shell smashed into the fort. The booming of the cannons woke the people of Charleston. They rushed to the harbor and cheered as the bursting shells lighted the dark sky. This week in our series, Jack Moyles and Stuart Spencer tell about the attack on Fort Sumter. Confederate leaders ordered the attack after President Abraham Lincoln refused to withdraw the small force of American soldiers at Sumter. Food supplies at the fort were very low, and Southerners expected hunger would force the soldiers to leave. But Lincoln announced he was sending a ship to Fort Sumter with food. Confederate President Jefferson Davis ordered his commander in Charleston, General Beauregard, to destroy the fort before the food could arrive. The attack started from Fort Johnson, across the harbor from Sumter. A Virginia congressman, Roger Pryor, was visiting Fort Johnson when the order to fire was given. The fort's commander asked Pryor if he would like the honor of firing the mortar that would begin the attack. No, answered Pryor, and his voice shook. I cannot fire the first gun of the war. But others could, and the attack began. At Fort Sumter, Major Robert Anderson and his men waited three hours before firing back at the Confederate guns. Anderson could not use his most powerful cannons. They were in the open at the top of the fort, where there was no protection for the gunners. Too many of his small force would be lost if he tried to fire these guns. So Anderson had his men fire the smaller cannon from better protected positions. These, however, did not do much damage to the Confederate guns. The shelling continued all day. A big cloud of smoke rose high in the air over Fort Sumter. The smoke was seen by United States Navy ships a few miles outside Charleston Harbor. They had come with the ship bringing food for the men at Sumter. There were soldiers on these ships, but they could not reach the fort to help Major Anderson. Confederate boats blocked the entrance to the harbor, and Confederate guns could destroy any ship that tried to enter. The commander of the naval force, Captain Fox, had hoped to move the soldiers to Sumter in small boats, but the sea was so rough that the small boats could not be used. Fox could only watch and hope for calmer seas. Confederate shells continued to smash into Sumter throughout the night and into the morning of the second day. The fires at Fort Sumter burned higher and smoke filled the rooms where soldiers still tried to fire their cannons. About noon, three men arrived at the fort in a small boat. One of them was Louis Wigfall, a former United States Senator from Texas, now 
a Confederate officer. He asked to see Major Anderson. I come from General Beauregard, he said. It is time to put a stop to this, sir. The flames are raging all around you, and you have defended your flag bravely. Will you leave, sir? Wigfall asked. Major Anderson was ready to stop fighting. His men had done all that could be expected of them. They had fought well against a much stronger enemy. Anderson said he would surrender if he and his men could leave with honor. Wigfall agreed. He told Anderson to lower his flag and the firing would stop. Down came the United States flag, and up went the white flag of surrender. The battle of Fort Sumter was over. More than 4,000 shells had been fired during the 33 hours of fighting, but no one on either side was killed. One United States soldier, however, was killed the next day, when a cannon exploded as Anderson's men prepared to leave the fort. The news of Anderson's surrender reached Washington late Saturday, April 13th. President Lincoln and his cabinet met the next day and wrote a declaration that the president would announce on Monday. In it, Lincoln said, powerful forces had seized control in seven states of the South. He said these forces were too strong to be stopped by courts or policemen. Lincoln said troops were needed. He requested that the states send him 75,000 soldiers. He said these men would be used to get control of forts and other federal property seized from the Union. Lincoln knew he had the support of his own party. He also wanted Northern Democrats to give him full support. So Sunday evening, a Republican congressman visited the top Democrat of the North, Senator Stephen Douglas. The congressman urged Douglas to go to the White House and tell Lincoln that he would do all he could to help put down the rebellion in the South. At first, Douglas refused. He said Lincoln had removed Democrats, friends of his, from government jobs and had given the jobs to Republicans. Douglas said, he didn't like this. Anyway, he said, Lincoln probably did not want his advice. The congressman, George Ashman, urged Douglas to forget party politics. He said Lincoln and the country needed the senator's help. Douglas finally agreed to talk with Lincoln. He and Ashman went immediately to the White House. Lincoln welcomed his old political opponent. He explained his plans and read to Douglas the declaration he would announce the next day. Douglas said he agreed with every word of it, except, he said, 75,000 soldiers would not be enough. Remembering his problems with Southern extremists, he urged Lincoln to ask for 200,000 men. He told the president, You do not know the dishonest purposes of those men as well as I do. Lincoln and Douglas talked for two hours. Then the senator gave a statement for the newspapers. He said he still opposed the administration on political questions, but, he said, he completely supported Lincoln's efforts to protect the Union. Douglas was to live for only a few more months. He spent this time 
working for the Union. He traveled through the states of the Northwest, making many speeches. Douglas urged Democrats everywhere to support the Republican government. He told them, there can be no neutrals in this war, only patriots or traitors. Throughout the North, thousands of men rushed to answer Lincoln's call for troops. Within two days, a military group from Boston left for Washington. Other groups formed quickly in northern cities and began training for war. Lincoln received a different answer, however, from the border states between North and South. Virginia's governor said he would not send troops to help the North get control of the South. North Carolina's governor said the request violated the Constitution. He would have no part of it. Tennessee said it would not send one man to help force southern states back into the Union. But it said it would send 50,000 troops to defend southern rights. Lincoln got the same answer from the governors of Kentucky, Arkansas, and Missouri. For several days, it seemed that all these states would secede and join the Southern Confederacy. Lincoln worried most about Virginia, the powerful state just across the Potomac River from Washington. A secession convention already was meeting at the state capitol. On April 17th, the convention voted to take Virginia out of the Union. Virginia's vote to secede forced an American army officer to make a most difficult decision. The officer was Colonel Robert E. Lee, a citizen of Virginia. The Army's top commander, General Winfield Scott, had called Lee to Washington. Scott believed Lee was the best officer in the Army. Lincoln agreed. He asked Lee to take General Scott's job to become the Army chief. Lee was offered the job on the same day that Virginia left the Union. Our program was written by Frank Beardsley. The narrators were Jack Moyles and Stuart Spencer. Hey guys, today I'm going to show you how to make a Lego um, accessory gun. That's what I call it. It's one of my best customized guns i made so far. It's a pretty big gun, I mean, like, yeah. So, I'm going to show you how to make the two guns that go into it. So, this one, you put that in there. Like that, like you know those like quill, kind of like a quill, but like it's like a thing where it goes on to something and it stays on. So that's one of the guns. So you put like the regular guns, like these. I need that too. Hold on, I lost my other gun for it. 
Oh wait, hello is over there. So um, so these two guns are done. That gun's done, and the uh, one handgun's done. We need this handgun, a stud, a yellow, it's the same colors. So if you have a red, you need a red stud and then a red, like, uh, lever thing. So you, those are the dumb ones. Now you take a cup and you take a like cone triangle and then you have um, a cylinder. So you take your bazooka where the holes are. Sorry, you can't really see. See the holes? Yeah. So now you take um, the, ye the yellow handgun I showed you how to make. So, let me just put this back. Alright, so, um, take it. Put it in the first one that you can. Now take the regular handgun. Now like that. That's how it looks. So now you, you where the scope is, you put the cylinder in the back of the scope. Like this. Ah, crud. Oh. Alright, so. Hold on. Let me just put this down. As I said, put the cylinder in the back. Like this. And then put this gun in the front of the scope. So it should look like that. Now you take the claw thing and put it in the back, facing that way. And then you take, um, in the front piece, you put, you see this? You put the cup in the front like that. And that's how you make the accessory gun. Thanks for watching. Bye. All right, here is my latest project. It's a light switch that automatically turns on the closet lights whenever you open it up. As you can see, opening it up turns the lights on inside. On each of the doors, I have a switch with a hall sensor that detects the magnetic field of magnets mounted in here. So, turning it, opening it, turns it on. The light is controlled by the mic controller. When it detects that the door has been opened, it turns the light on so you know which door has been opened. So this door and this door do the same thing. See up here is the light. We have the wires that go up to the electronics that are in the attic. Uh, right now I have it so the light turns off after about 20 seconds. So if you forget to shut the doors, it will turn off by itself. I'm going to adjust that soon, so it's about five minutes. So, works like that. See, green light means it's open on both. And the lights are off. Here we have the electronics of the project. Coming in here, we have the 120 volts. Comes into this box. I would rectify that down to 3.3 volts to power the MSP430 microcontroller. Uh, these two telephone cables go down through the ceiling here. And that's for the switches to control the door. Back here is a relay, which we have for the light. So that is powered off 120 volts, and the microcontroller switches that.